Welcome back to another episode of IGN Unfiltered, my monthly interview series where I sit down with the best, brightest, most interesting minds in the games industry. Uh, today, very special guest, Jeff Keeley. You're about to see him on Gamescom opening night live. He has uh, really become one of the, the big primary faces of, of spreading the message of video games throughout pop culture, the Game Awards, E3 Game Critics Awards, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Jeff, good to see you, my friend. Good to see you, McCaffrey. I was spreading something. I was worried what you were going to say, but I was spreading good news. All right. <laughs> no, Never well, know no, in a COVID you and I, world. Normally, normally, we get to hang out and chat for a while during E3 Judges Week in May down in Santa Monica. So I figure we didn't get that this year. Why not just have have this conversation on the air? We'll, we'll catch up with what Yeah, no, I remember we, we had talked about doing this, I think, in March around GDC. Uh, yeah. when I was going to be up there and that didn't happen. That's when, you know, I was working on the, the Half-Life Alex stuff and everything. So yeah, I'm, no, I'm, I'm a big fan of the show. I've been watching for, for years. So, uh, yeah, fun to be on here with you and just, just talk about things. I'm always hosting things. I never get to talk about games as often. So this is fun for yeah, me. Yeah. Turn turn the tables a little bit. And you know, the, the this is like the inside the actor studio thing kind of, as you know, so we, we like to dive back into the past. Cause I look, so it turns out you and I are almost the same age. We're about exactly a year apart. So yeah. were you uh, an NES kid like me or do you, what was your early, uh, yeah, entree into, was, the, into the games? I, yeah, for sure. Like had NES, Genesis, like all that stuff. I remember my brother and I would like, you know, get the ROMs from Japan. I grew up in Toronto, Canada. So it's like I, we'd get, you know, like, uh, yeah, ROMs with the adapters and things like that. And we would play a ton of NES stuff. But I I probably identify more as a PC gamer to to start yeah. at least. Like I was playing all that stuff, but the the family computer at home uh, where I would play like the early adventure games. Those were the ones that I think really like grabbed me more than some of the console stuff. So again, I was playing NES stuff, but um, it was the like Monkey Islands and the original Sierra adventure games, like the Space Quest, Police Quest, Leisure Suit Larry, Quest for Glory, Gabriel Knight, like all that. That was the kind of stuff that really, um, I think, got me into games in a big way. And those are some of my most resonant memories. But of course, like, yeah, I was like, consoles were downstairs on the tv and then in the family room was the the pc boy see i i knew there's a reason we get along it's because we like the same games <laughs> and it's and see now you know you fast forward in your career i'll bet like me you've probably had a lot of moments where you you meet some of these people like whether it's ron gilbert or tim schaefer some of these adventure game uh designers and heroes where you think like boy if I could, if I could go back to my twelve-year-old self and show him this, this moment, he'd be pretty. He'd, he'd his head would explode. Oh well, that was like what's amazing to me is when like I, Tim Schafer, I consider a good friend, and it's like this is a guy with like Day of the Tentacle and Monkey Island and Full Throttle. I mean, these are games that I really idolize, and you know, my the whole reason I kind of was able to get into games was because I, I and why I got so excited about the industry was I got to meet a lot of these designers virtually when I was a kid, right? Um, and then I was, you know, got to beta test a lot of the early Sierra games all online. So that's kind of really when I fell in love with the creative process behind games was like getting to like file bugs to Al Lowe on like Freddy Farkas Frontier Pharmacist and like all these games back in the day. Um, I got to know these guys virtually and I was just a kid. I was like a, you know, 12 or 13 year old kid in Canada who was yeah. like, you know, dialing up to the Sierra BBS and trying to limit how many minutes I was on because you got charged by the minute to like get to the hint line to figure things out. Um, but yeah, I, I like had an appreciation of those games. And then I was just so lucky as a kid that I wrote a letter to Sierra online saying, I love your games. How do you make them? And I got a response back saying, well, we'd love to love you to help us make them. Here's a beta version of a game. And that's like how wow. it all started for me. That's insane. Like that's that's one of those things where uh, it's like you just you never know. You just you put it out there. You put good yeah. out there and good comes back. Right. It's just kind of wild how life works sometimes. No, I, I say to people time and again, just take the risk. Right. And take the leap. Like you said, I was a 12 year old kid in Canada and I just wrote a letter and like mailed it via traditional mail from Toronto, Canada, Oakhurst, California. And basically I don't have the letter. I wish I did, but I said to Sierra, like, I love your games. I'd love to learn more about how you make them. And this lady, her name, I still remember Gano Hain responded back to me and said, Jeff, thank you so much for your note. 
Um, you know, we do beta testing on games and we have a new game coming up uh, called uh, EcoQuest 2, the search for Cetus. And we'd love you to sort of like help us play this and tell us what you think. And you said it was just like right place, right time. I'm so honored that happened. But I tell people again and again, like, just email like and I, you know, just yeah. email Gabe Newell, email Phil Spencer. And like, you'd be surprised. I mean, and the industry has changed, obviously, from those days. Um, but I'm I always like even now with Game Awards, I'll just like take a risk and like, you know, email Elon Musk about come to the show. And it's like he'll show up. Right. And it's just like it's just one of those things like I just say people like especially in the Internet, like just reach out to people, see what happens. Yeah, because it's I, I'm I'm the same way where it's, you know, it's what's what's the worst they can say is no. Right. That's or just it. not respond. And it's just like this is I get ignored <laughs> all the time. And like my, you know, my world is it, there's a lot of rejection when, you know, you're booking the game awards and people always say, like, why didn't you have this game or that game? It's like, you know, I asked Valve for, you know, a decade to like come show, you know, a Half-Life or something. And like every year it's like, don't have anything ready for you. And it's like we ask all the same questions and you just have to be used to like getting the nose. But yeah, like I just I, I've I've always been a fan of just reaching out, asking people, staying in touch with folks. And as you said, worst case is they don't respond or they say no, but there might actually be an opportunity there. Yeah. So along these lines, this was a, I didn't know this about you. This is on your Wikipedia page from a okay. Los Let's Angeles Times true. piece on you. It says it said Keeley's first foray, or not first, but Keeley's foray into video game reporting and presentation had been through Cybermania 94, the ultimate mm -hmm. games awards, the first video game award show broadcast on television. Keeley was 14 at the time, but was brought in to help write lines for the celebrity hosts to read. The show was not considered successful, aimed more for comedy than celebration, but from it, Keeley was inspired to develop some type of equivalent of the Academy Awards for video games in his career. So how on earth do you manage to get roped in and you're writing, you're, you're writing on an award show at age 14? I know this is like one of those strange coincidences, but I had started writing for uh, I think Strategy Plus magazine uh, when I was a kid, right? So I started. What the quick story is, I started beta testing games. I was on CompuServe. I knew a lot about yeah. these games when they came out because I beta tested them. So I would kind of give people hints and tips. An editor from Strategy Plus reached out to me saying, "Hey, you seem to know a lot about games. You want to write for our magazine?" So that started when I was like thirteen. I previewed Will Wright's wow. Sim Farm was the first big preview I wrote. Um, and then it just happened, I think the next year, that this award show for video games was being produced out of Toronto by a friend of my dad. In the backyard. Um, and he heard thing from my dad. It's like, oh, my son's kind of into this video game thing. Um, he's like, oh, well, that's great because I have all these writers that know nothing about video games and need to learn about them quickly because we're doing this award show for TBS at Universal Studios in Hollywood. So can you come in and help us? So yeah, I became the, It's you can still watch this show on YouTube. Um, there's a version of it. It's hosted by the late, great Leslie Nielsen from Naked Gun and Jonathan Taylor Thomas from Home Improvement. Uh, and I got the title of Interactive Product Specialist on that show. And yeah, I, I wrote dialogue for William Shatner um, to narrate during the nominee packages. So he was like describing Mist and Mortal Kombat and Doom. Uh, and yeah, it was like insane. And I got to go down to... Universal Studios Hollywood, uh, I think it was like the set of the Conan stunt show is where they did this. And I got to sit in the audience with my dad and see this award show for video games, which was like trippy and weird, like Herbie Hancock performed. Um, Will Arnett like read cheat codes for arcade games and they went like live to him when he was a no. It was just like it's and, and I think best action game was presented by Matthew Perry and Hillary Swank to Jay Wilbur from id for doom. And it was just like, it's funny, like how everything comes together. But yeah, I worked on that and uh, there wasn't a Cybermania 95, but it definitely inspired me to think of award shows and, and people now always think of me, oh, he's the Spike VGA guy or he's the G Foria guy. But yeah, it actually started way back in 1994. So, so at that point, I mean, your, your dad's got a front row seat to this, like literally with you. It, are your parents super supportive? Like what, was there an idea of, yeah. was this always what you wanted to do? Or, or did you kind of have other ambitions of, well, all right, when we go, go when I get out of high school, I'll go to college and then I want to do X. Yeah. Um, they were all very supportive. I mean, when I was a kid, like 
you know, they had to buy me a 3DO and that was like, you know, thousand dollars in Canada or something <laughs> like that. And they like, you know, I, I, I got one when I was playing my, uh, you know, my crash and burn on 3DO or something. Um, yeah. So they were always supportive. And I, you know, I went through high school and all of college. Uh, I moved down to the States and went to USC for college, but all through high school and college, I was writing about video games. That's what I did, right? I've never had another job or a traditional job, right? I've always just kind of like done writing about games. And I always say to people, I was lucky that when I was in college, I was able to like freelance and write about games, but do it in like a, in a subtle way where it's like, I could never make enough money to really make a career out of it, but I didn't need it to be a career because it was kind of a job on the side. So yeah, all through college, I was like writing for magazines primarily. I, you know, went down, I started my final hours series. I went to valve in 1997, um, 1998 when they were doing half-life. Um, so yeah, I, their parents were always supportive. And then I went to college. I was thinking of maybe going to law school. Um, and I got into a bunch of law schools and kind of decided to defer it. Um, and just never honestly got back to it and just kind of became a career, um, naturally over time. And I graduated and then, G4 was starting and there was all this TV stuff and YouTube. And I just kind of like never went to law school and, and, and it became a career sort of right when it needed to become one. Um, and that's why people always ask, you know, how are you able to get these guests or these, you know, games on the show? And it's cause I've known a lot of these people for 20 or 30 years, um, as part of the industry. And, and you know, it's like, you've been around, it's like, it's all kind of the same people like making the games, yeah. which is, is, you know, good and bad, but, um, yeah, it's a lot of the same people. So yeah, parents are super supportive and I made it a career sort of honestly, not even deliberately. Like I didn't have a goal of like one day I'm going to do this crazy big award show for video games by myself. That was just a natural course of sort of what happened with G4 and Spike and the desire to, to do that. Um, I think my, my goal has always been to like try and elevate this industry and, and have people understand and respect it. And like you, when I was growing up, it's like games weren't, weren't the cool thing to do. People didn't really understand that. I remember on my college application, I wrote something about a CD-ROM and the admissions office called me back and said like, what is this? Is this a misspelling? What's a CD-ROM? And they just like, they just had like no concept of what I was talking about, but I was like, so passionate about this medium and games for where where they were going to take entertainment um and it's nice now that you know i feel like finally especially this year games people are appreciating the power of this entertainment form but i was just so taken by it i said of course like this is the future of entertainment i gotta wrap myself around it i'm so interested in the games interested in the people that make them let me find a way to like celebrate that uh, and you know, it's, I was never necessarily always like a previews or reviews guy. I was interested in like the features and the people and the, the stories behind the games. So your, your parents never tried to nudge you towards the law school or express any disappointment when you didn't go, they were, they wholly embraced the, no, enthusiasm? They've, they've been like super, super, uh, supportive. And I'm, I'm grateful for that. Right. That it was, uh, yeah, like I was trying to figure out like what was the business around what I was doing and and yeah, it was I think they liked that I had a a passion and also like games, you know, kind of kept me out of trouble in many ways, right? I was like, you know, playing games, writing about games, I wasn't partying, I wasn't, you know, I was just kind of like I did well in school, it wasn't like I was, you know, binging on games and not doing my schoolwork and stuff like that. So yeah, I just kind of managed it and kept to myself and as I said, like games kind of kept me out of trouble and uh I think that was meaningful um to them and yeah i just like slowly built it into a business um but yeah there was not a lot of pressure of like hey this video game thing what is it because like right after college i started writing for like time magazine and entertainment weekly and got like some much bigger prominent gaming things so it was growing and it wasn't like i was yeah. you know only writing for egm or something nothing against egm but it's just i think my parents were like wow like he's doing like time magazine he's writing about video games that's cool um so yeah always been like super supportive and I'm, I'm lucky in that way. Yeah. It's so important, isn't it? Cause I, I was the same way. Like I, I was from, I would say it was about, it was about high school when I was reading, you know, I read EGM as a kid. And then I, like you, I, I went like exclusively to PC gaming. So PC gamer, I would read every month. And I just said, you know what? Writing is my best subject. I enjoy it. I'm going to write, I'm going to write about video games. That's what's going to happen. 
And I was just like laser focused and there was no backup plan. That was it. But my parents, yeah. same thing, were, were never like, well, no, you've got to figure out something to do. You, and it's just, you've got the support of, parental support is just so important for, <laughs> that'd be, not that I'm any kind of expert, but to any any parents out there, just nurture those enthusiasms. Yeah, and, and look, at- you know, you and I both, I think, had a passion too, right? And I always say like, it's, you know, I feel like I've never really worked a day in my life. Like, I just love what I do. And it's like, it's not yeah. work, you know, it's not like, oh man, I got to go figure out what announcements we're going to have at the Game Awards. I'm like, jazz to like see these games and you know pushing for awesome stuff so yeah i think i think my parents and other people just sensed that it was something that i was like you know really excited about um and just naturally grew into something organically same thing with you it's like it's like i love what i do i'm you know i never saw games as this bridge to like oh i'm gonna do a great game award show and then i'm gonna like go produce the oscars like that's never been my end game it's like games have been what you know define my career and even when i've you know i started writing some more traditional journalism stuff for time. I did like a big story about Cirque du Soleil and like a feature on Matt Drudge and Drudge Report. And like, I had fun doing that stuff, Um, but I always just like kept coming back to games because it just felt the most interesting and compelling to me because this industry, you know, the technology is always improving. The games are always getting better. Um, So it's never bored me. And that just has ended up kind of just defining my career and now as you said you and i get older it's like this is kind of what i do and i'm really like yeah. i'm so honored um and lucky that i found that passion early right and i have lots of friends that i think are still trying to like figure out like well what are they really passionate about what do they want to do um and like for me yeah when i found games when i was 12 or 13 i'm just like so grateful that i found that as you said i had the environment to support that passion and i was able to turn it into a career and not everyone is that lucky that they find something they're, you know, that passionate about when they're that young. So I'm, you know, I'm grateful for that. How old, how old were you when you started Game Slice? Where'd Game Slice, I started in 1996. So I don't know, I guess, yeah, I guess I was like mid teens. Um, yeah. And that was, uh, yeah, a couple years after Cybermania and I wanted to launch a website um, about games and it was like the early days of the internet, right? It was like, you know, like mm-hmm. next gen might've been around, but it was like super intelligent gamer. I remember there were a couple other big websites in the mid nineties and I launched that as a CompuServe form and as a website at the same time. And yeah, I was still, I was in high school then still. Um, and yeah, I launched that as like my first kind of venture on the web and still keep my em- email address the same as it was, you know, 25 years ago. Um, and that was, you know, you can go back to the Wayback Machine and still find like, you know, Game Slice from 1995 and 19 or 96 and 97, um, which is fun for me, actually, to like, I think I launched it with a preview of Hexen from Raven, which was the sequel to Heretic. And that's what we kind of like yep. kicked it off with. Um, and yeah, it was fun. Like I would do my E3 coverage there. I would like write about games. I did a when I went to college, I ended up doing a daily blog almost on game slice called the gist list which was like a kind of list of like what i thought was cool and not in the gaming industry it was like a lot of work and i i now i see all these content creators and friends that that do youtube videos daily and i'm like i just i I still have nightmares of like the pressure to like every day write a blog but i would go to the computer lab at usc and like write a blog every day and like post it to this website and i did that for for a lot of college which was insane thinking back but yeah I, I launched it in high school and then carried it all through um through college as, as a website about games and then a bit after that i remember you did you did the back page column for us at official xbox magazine <laughs> for a for a yeah. good little while there yeah that was probably that. college post-college yeah i was that's why i was doing like a lot of freelance writing right it wasn't even like yeah. the video stuff wasn't a part of it like i was behind the scenes on cybermania i primarily wrote like reviews for like Entertainment Weekly for a long time. I was like the video game guy that like wrote a lot of reviews and features there. Um, I was doing my behind the games kind of final hours stories every couple of years. Um, So I did like Quake 3, I did Black and White with Peter Molyneux. I did Prince of Persia Sands of Time with Ubisoft. And I was sort of, you know, every couple of years I do a big um, game and a story on that. But yeah, the the on camera stuff and video stuff didn't really start to probably like the early 2000s when Victor Lucas, um, who you know well, like, you know, asked me to start hosting some stuff for Electric Playground. 
Um, and that really sort of like became the next phase of my career, um, you know, with doing things on camera. So uh, you mentioned Final Hours uh, convincing Gabe Newell uh, to yeah. to let you come down and, and uh, do the last little bit, uh, you know, profile that the end run of that game. Like, it's, and it's it goes back to what you're saying earlier. You just email, right? That's that's all it yeah. takes sometimes. Yes, it's a little a little harder now than it probably was in the 1990s. <laughs> but yeah, I was like, and again, Half Life. You know, yeah, I remember like that was kind of nothing, right? No one knew right. it was an it was. unknown had, quantity. And I had written for Sierra had a magazine called Interaction, which was like their you know probably remember like their kind of quarterly magazine where they would preview their games that were coming up. I think I'd written a story about Half Life for that. Um, and yeah, I just got like really interested in it. I'm like, I think there's kind of something interesting to do here. I wrote a story about the making of Unreal. Um, that was the first kind of behind the scenes that I did. And then, yeah, Half-Life was the next one. It was just like a game I was excited about. And back then, Gabe was like a nobody, right? They were just like right. a bunch of ex-Microsoft guys yep. who were trying to make a game. So he was like, cool, this guy wants to come and spend you know a couple days with us. Um, and I flew up with... Uh, Genevieve Waldman, who's still in the industry, and we went to visit Valve and did like this story with, um, you know, Gabe and Doug Lombardi and all these folks um, back then. And again, like I, I always say it's a great example of just you sometimes have to bet on things that might not pay off for a long time, but you're just excited about naturally. And, you know, now obviously I know the Valve guys incredibly well, and I've kind of charted the whole course of that company. But yeah, sometimes you just have to like reach out and take a risk. And again, like, you know, it sounds weird now that they would say yes but back then you got to remember yeah gabe was like a small little studio that didn't even right. know if their game was gonna work um so yeah I, yeah I got lucky in a way too with that one yeah there were no real like gatekeepers like because i actually have a i mean not quite that story but uh, i gabe used to go on uh, irc channels like gaming mm -hmm. irc channels and that i would hang out in those things i was in college too i guess i would have been probably a year behind you and same yeah. thing following the game through pc gamer and and I remember catching him and catching Gabe in IRC once and asking him if I could beta test Half-Life. And he literally sent me an RC4, release candidate four disc of the original Half-Life, which I I wish I still had somewhere. I was gonna say but I have I, I have like a, all my alphas and betas from the original <laughs> Half-Life. And whenever I show them, there's like this internet furor that like released the betas or alphas. And yeah, I kept all those discs just because there was something special about that game. But yeah, he said that's like back yeah. in the day, it's it's hard for people to realize like it was, it was just a, it was a different issue. It was just smaller and it's like, it was, but you know, really good people. Right. And that's what part of the reason I think sure. I've always stayed in games is that I really like the people in it. It's a really honest, good industry. Um, and that's why I've never kind of wanted to go elsewhere. Cause I really like, just, just love the people in it. So fast forward. Now you've just done, you're not here for your health. We're going to, we're here to promote Jeff Keeley. You've got opening night live, oh, no. of course, the game awards, which I'm going to ask you about later. But um, you've also just finished, available now on Steam, the final hours of Half-Life Alex, where you went back and chronicled the, uh, the the sort of stretch development, although it covers a lot more than just the end of development. It covers really the whole thing, the whole process yeah. of making a Half-Life VR game and the, the sort of internal fears and trepidations and dangers that came along with that. And so I, what I wanted to ask you is, besides telling people that they should go check it out because... It's this cool Steam app that's interactive and it's got some cool game assets in it, a lot of never before seen stuff. But I wanted to ask you, without spoilers, what was your reaction when you first finished Alex to the end of that game? Uh, well, so it always gets a little spoiled for me because I'm, I'm, you know, kind of aware of what they're doing, but I... Uh, yeah. yeah, so I played, and I don't know how much we want to spoil the end of it, but I, when I played it, it was a little unclear to me what was going on because mm -hmm. uh, there's, there's again, I'll, I'll speak in code without giving it away, but there's sort of a credit yeah. sequence in between two things. And when I played it, there wasn't a credit sequence. It just went right into the thing afterwards. So mm -hmm. I thought there was sort of this weird body transfer. Like, I didn't know what was going on. I remember saying to right. Eric Wilpon and stuff, I'm like, what, what, what happened there? <laughs> um, so it was a little unclear. It's like I, I, the the surprise is sometimes spoiled for me because I hear see things in development. Um, but yeah, I you know, the Valve guys thought for a long time about kind of how to wrap this up. What was the right coda for it? Um, so I was like, I was really excited with what I saw at the end of the game. 
but it was something I was, I was remember being confused by it. And they were like, yeah, we need to clarify that. Cause like the dialogue wasn't in and it, there wasn't this credit sequence to break these two things apart. But yeah, it was, uh, it was a real experience playing that. And, you know, I, I was so excited that valve was doing that. And, you know, I had taken a break from doing final hours for probably about five years, right? Last one I did was yeah. Titanfall. Um, just cause I got so busy with game awards and those projects are, you know, I, I don't have a ghostwriter. Like I really do all that myself, like the, all the interviews, all the transcripts. And this one like was so confidential. I couldn't, I had to transcribe myself cause like I couldn't even trust some right. online transcript service. Um, and valve was obviously concerned about, um, you know, anything leaking about like what, what sure. happened with half-life three, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, yeah, I, I was really excited when, when I finally found out they were really going to do it and really felt it was happening. That was just such joy. Cause I mean, for so many years, you know, I would always, sometimes I'll daydream about like, what, you know, what am I going to do at game awards? And I always for years would like imagine the moment of like, you know, this figure in the shadows with a crowbar and people realize like, Oh my God, it's Gabe. And, you know, walking out on stage and showing, you know, something new half life. And that's the kind of stuff like, you know, I'm weird. Like that gets me like really excited to like, just think maybe that one day that was going to come. And for a long time, like I just never thought they were going to touch it again. And there'd been so many um, different things. So when I got to play it and it ha still had the magic of half-life in it, it just brought yeah. me such great joy that um, to see that world back alive again after so many years. And that's what really compelled me to say, like, we have to tell the story of, of what happened here. Um, and again, like, you know, now of course people are like, that's not enough. Where's Half-Life three. Um, <laughs> but it was, yeah, I, I just, I really love the ending and I, I love how they did something different with it. And also how modern and high tech and relevant that game felt like it yeah. wasn't, you know, like some, clue gvr version of like half-life 2 like that was a true next generation half-life game well for me yeah it's it is it's the game it's the vr game that we always imagined that vr would be when those vr arcades first popped up in the malls in the 90s yep. and it's like this is finally that we've finally been waiting for 20 years here it is uh, yeah, no, the, so, the combat and everything was, I mean, just so great. And I mean, you're so active, like it's such an experience. And I, I hate that more people can't, can't get that experience. Um, because it's, you know, it's not that accessible and that you have to have, you know, VR headset and PC and everything. But yeah, as, as an experience this year, it's like such a powerful game. When I finally played the fi the final version in March, um, just all the little tweaks and, and elements, it was, it's, it's great for me. Like I just, I fall more in love with games when I see the creative process of what they go through and how these things come online. And it you know, destroys a little bit of the magic for me that, you know, the, the games are, are spoiled for me in advance, but you know, it's, yeah. I'm happy to do it because I appreciate the process that they all go through, but also, you know, never, never crossed in my mind, like, Oh, I want to go make a game. Right. And that was the thing is, you know, like a lot of journalists when we were starting out, it's like, it was almost like a bridge to go work at a game company. And for me, it's never been about that. It's always been like, I think I'm stronger and better supporting everybody. Yeah, I, I feel the same way. It's, uh, it's, there's, I kind of like, I like what we do. It's, it's fun. Um, yeah, love it. G4, you know, you mentioned, you mentioned G4. Mm -hmm. you know, it was a, G4 is coming back. Your, yeah, well, that's what I wanted to ask you about. It's like, th this is getting teased now. What are, what are yeah. your thoughts on this? Are, are they reaching out? Whoever this is, are they reaching out to you? Are you going to be involved? What's the plan here? Yeah, I I started hearing about it probably about um, a year ago. And as I understand it, um, Tucker Roberts, who's the son of Brian Roberts, the, the CEO of Comcast, is um, kind of putting this together. And, you know, G4, there was a place and a time for it. I had a lot of fun working there. Um, you know, it was pre-YouTube and pre-Twitch, right? Yeah. I mean, it was sort of like the early 2000s. Um, I worked there and then I kind of went to Spike and there was actually a time where I was kind of working at G4 and Spike and MTV. Um, so yeah, I'm interested to see what they do. There was a, a couple of years ago they had reached out to me or NBC had because they were trying to do G4 as like an over the top channel. It was a lot of the guys from like USA Network and Sci-Fi. That never happened, but they reached out to me about that. No one's reached out to me about this one yet. Um, I'm curious like what they do. Uh, you know, everyone has an affinity for G4. And I think there's something to do. Uh, you know, my 
my general view now is that I'm not sure people want to watch a linear network about, you know, any topic, right? You know, like same thing with MTV. It's like, you know, no one watches MTV for music videos. No one really watches MTV right. anymore. It's like they watch stuff on YouTube, right? So I think it'll be interesting to see how G4 reinvents that brand for the bite size social media content that, um, you know, we consume now and how we consume media. So I think it's a really smart idea um, to bring it back. I just think they have to be really smart in how they approach what the content is and, and kind of what G4 stands for. So yeah, I mean, I'll talk to them at some point. I haven't reached out to them. I've talked to some of the hosts and like they're, I think trying to figure out ways to like involve some of those hosts again and do things around it. Um, it's just like, you know, for my gen, like how hard it is to constantly produce content and, and build stuff around it. So I'll be curious to see how big the ambition is of like, are they trying to launch a 24 seven, you know, network about video games, or are they going to do something that's a little more bite size? Um, so I don't, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm excited when anyone wants to do more stuff around gaming. There's this other network Venn that I think is launching soon, which is like another kind of attempt to do like a video game content network. Um, you know, I found my strength is in doing fewer, bigger things and yeah. like the game awards, you know, that takes me, legitimately six months of my year to put that together. And I don't think people always realize that, but uh, I sort of have to go away to come back and do big things. And the idea of doing like a daily show or a weekly show, I've done that stuff um, and I enjoy it, but it comes at a cost of some of these other things to do. So yeah, like I'm excited to see what G4 does. I think, you know, I think I, I wouldn't be surprised if like Olivia and Kevin and and, you know, a lot of the hosts come back in some way and, and get involved in it. Um, and it's fun, right? I mean, that was a big part of my career and I'd, I'd be super supportive of, of seeing what they do. But yeah, it's, it sounds like it's, it was, I had heard it was originally coming this year and then the teaser said 21. So I guess it's probably a little bit further out. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm excited to see what they do. Well, you hit on, uh, I was just going to go next to the Game Awards, talk about that for a few minutes, but you, you actually mentioned how it's, it's six months out of your year. And I think, I wanted to talk a little bit more about that because I, you're right. I think, I mean, I have a little window into it from some of the stuff that I helped produce at IGN. And I mean, I have, yeah. I've never worked on, I've never spent six months of my year on something like the game awards, but like the process for building it, I mean, does it effectively happen year round? Are you, are you more or less starting the next one as soon as the, the, the last one airs? Yeah. I mean, for sure. I mean, we, it depends like, you know, in a, in a normal year, like we have to book the theater probably a year out, right? Cause we need like yeah. 10 days in Microsoft theater, like build the show and put it together. So there's, you know, competing concerts and events. So yeah, we got to pick a date. And then, yeah, the, the content in that show, uh, you know, like my hand is in pretty much everything. So it's like, you know, last year it's like, well, like came up with the idea, like, let's do something fun with the Muppets and untitled goose. And like, let's see if we can get that all together and let's write it. Let's produce it. Let's put it together. Let's, you know, team up churches with Kojima and introduce them to do something. Let's figure out something fun for Green Day to do. Let's talk to Beat Saber. So yeah, there's a lot of like triangulation of things that come together for that show to be what it is. And I'm, you know, very heavily involved in like figuring out the world premieres, working with the studios. Like even this week, I've had three or four calls on like games that are going to get announced at the show. And like, what's the idea for the trailer? What's a fun way to do this? Um, so yeah, I involve myself pretty intimately in the 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 production of the show and working with the studios yeah. on it and you know even though i host it and i own it it's like something where i'm you know, extremely involved and to to my personal detriment probably i'm very heavily involved in every aspect of that show but it's some people will say i'm just sort of a control freak about it but it's also i think because i've sort of lived and survived through a lot of the other award shows and and was always frustrated to some degree about what those were now the fact that I kind of get to own it and author it is a is a huge opportunity for me, but I also feel a great obligation to really like make it as good as possible for our industry. So I yeah, I put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears into it. I'm happy to do it. But as you said, uh, I think people sometimes assume like, oh, he just kind of like starts in October and sees what, you know, what's around. And and yeah, no, we now, I mean, studios build custom trailers and, and, you know, sprint towards the game awards as their announcement date. And, you know, last year, like with the, 
you know, the new Xbox reveal, like that doesn't happen overnight. Like that's like months of negotiation to, you know, get that stuff to happen. Well, you, you touched on uh, how you've seen other, other entities, other people controlling it, do it. You know, you've, you've got ownership of the game awards prior to that. Of course you did it with spike TV. Did, did yep. spike ever really get it? Uh, it, it, it almost seems like going out on your own with it has been the best thing to ever happen to you. Yeah. You know, I, I take a positive view of the spike years in that I learned how to make an award show from some of the best people in the business. Right. And like, you know, I would have never known how to do the game awards without kind of the trial by fire that was, you know, the VGAs. And I always say that like spike spike really invested in, the VGAs over, you know, over a decade, right? I mean, I'm sure they spent, you know, tens of millions of dollars, like sort of building this show, trying to support the industry at a time when no one else was, right? And, you know, G4 sure. sort of like kind of did stuff with Gforia, but was never at the level of what Spike did. Um, so it was never the show I fully wanted it to be, but I learned a lot through that. And I, I still respect the fact that uh, Kevin Kay, the president of Spike, like for many years, like invested in that show when honestly it wasn't, it wasn't really rating huge for them. Um, it was, you know, it was a, it was a long investment in gaming and yes, like for sure there were aspects of it that were kind of silly. Um, and you know, a little too celebrity focused and whatnot. And it was, you know, painful for me on one level. Um, but it was also kind of like the best opportunity our industry had to get some exposure and look, some people could argue that it would have been better to have nothing, right. than have something that sort of, you know, defeats sort of what the industry might be about. But I think there were a lot, like I was proud of a lot of the big moments that we had over the years at that show. Um, You know, there were some great years and like the year that Jack Black hosted for brutal legend and, you know, we elevated Tim Schafer and he had a whole musical number. Like there were some really things I was proud of over those years. So spike, I think, got it but they were also inside a big media organization that needed to make a sexy television show to sell to advertisers and you know that's why you know the jersey shore cast was there to present because there was this view that you know we had to gaming wasn't enough right and we had to go to all these other talents and 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 celebrities to sort of validate the show and make it feel relevant and what my view was always that I actually think the gaming audience is really big and there are tens of millions of gamers. And that's the bullseye you have to hit first is like delivering a show for that audience. But you know, the producers there for many years, like would hear from the sales team about like, we need some big sexy names to, you know, sell it to advertisers and, you know, Tim Schafer and Cliffy B and Hideo Kojima didn't, you know, register for them. So it's kind of inside the structure of a big television network. I, I understood why the show was what it was. And to Spike's credit, they, they listened to me and, and worked with me and it was collaborative. There were absolutely frustrating aspects of it. Um, but as you said, it kind of led to the game awards uh, and, you know, I'm grateful for that, but I, I look back on it, not as it, like, you have to be patient in life with some of these things. And I was always kind of working within the system to learn how to build this, to eventually allow me to create the game awards. And I always say to people like the game awards wouldn't happen without all the stuff that I had done before at spike. So I, I look back at it as like a good experience. Sure. It was painful for people that watch the show. I'm sure sometimes. And and for those of us that really cared about the industry, but uh, I learned a lot from that that time. Well, to that point, I mean, f- for me as a viewer, every year uh, I feel like the, the, that the Game Awards seems to evolve. Like it started off, I remember I, feel, I felt like in the, the first or second time you did it, I was like, man, that was, there's a lot of neat stuff, but boy, that was way too long. So then, then I noticed, and then I yep. see the next year, it gets shorter. And it, I feel like you are evolving it. You are adapting and growing from it every year. I'm kind of curious to ask you about the the ideal balance. This is a hot topic every year. The balance between re- game reveals and game awards. How mm-hmm. do you sort of wrestle with that? At at a, you know of celebrating these game developers, but yep. you know you want to have these cool moments of of unveiling games that also, quite frankly, bring in viewers as well. Exactly. No, that's the 
eternal debate with the show, right? And and everyone will have a different opinion on it. Um, my Twitter feed, I do a poll, I think every year around this saying like, what's more important to you? You know, the awards, the world premieres. And it's usually like 80 plus percent of people say like world premieres. Like that's what they, you know, the audience yeah. cares about um, or a section of the audience cares about. And to me, you know, the it's a magic formula that works for our show because the game announcements are what drive, as you said, a, a mass audience into the show, which then means when we give an award to Carol Shaw or we give an award yeah. to the Disco Elysium team, that game is discovered and those developers are seen by tens of millions of people, which I think is really, really powerful um, as a concept. And look, there are lots of other award shows in the industry and I'm supportive of them, but you know, they're often you know, in front of thousands of people or you know, a room of people of, of their peers, which is really important. But for us, I love the idea that we are exposing tens of millions of people to these developers and their stories in the show. So you know, if we just did a pure award show, the ratings would be nowhere near what they are now. So it's always a balance between the two. Um, and I think I try and be sort of equitable with that in having kind of like half awards, half game announcements. Um, and that formula has worked for us, right? I mean, there will always be people that come down on the opinion of like, you didn't present enough awards or like, why did you present this award in the pre-show or on the side stage? And I'm honored in a way that people have that criticism because it means the awards really matter to people, right? It's, they're not yeah. sort of like throwaways um, because, you know, this is like the big award show for gaming and people really care about the awards and when they win, um, you know, I got one of the trophies here. It's like when, when people win, it's like, it means a lot to people. So we think about that. I'm like, it's, it's not something that doesn't cross our mind, but I think you have to balance it out to, you know, drive the biggest potential audience. And that means the biggest impact. And, you know, when I hear from the Cuphead guys one year or Celeste team, they're like, wow, our game won a bunch of awards and we sold so many copies after the game awards because there were like so many people watching and discovering. And I remember that happened with Dead Cells too. Awesome. Like that means something to me that like they're winning awards, but they're also, you know, winning hearts and minds and consumers. Um, and that to me is like, the reason our show exists really is to like help people discover a great game. So if I can do that on a mass scale through these announcements, that's great. And I'd also say like the world premiere is like, that's the future of our industry. And I think we'd love to look back, but we want to look forward. And that's what excites me about the show is like, what hot new thing are we going to announce for next year? I mean, it's the reason we watch E3 or Gamescom or all these other things. So um, like, Sure, it's marketing, but it's like it's a preview of where our business is going and it's only getting better. So I like I think the world premieres are a really big, important part of the show and we're never going to lose that piece of it. Uh, was Joseph Ferris was handing him a microphone the best thing that ever happened to your show? Yeah, Joseph's uh, he's a trip. Um, yeah, <laughs> I. Uh, okay. Oh, no, and he was, you know, he, I always say with Joseph is like, he knows he's putting on a show for you, right? Um, and it's like, yeah, he was, uh, it's great though, but, you know, we announced his, you know, um, his game, what was called Hazelight at the time, um, at the first Game Awards in 2014 with Peter Moore, who's leaving Liverpool, so maybe he's coming back to the gaming yeah. industry. But, um, yeah, so Joseph's been great. I mean, we've been talking to him this year because he's got his uh, It Takes Two, his next game, so he's mm -hmm. eager to come be a part of the show in some way this year. So we'll see if we can work that out. But um, yeah, he's, I mean, I love those moments that are unpredictable. And one of the things as a, as an award show producer, what really gets me excited is just every year there's like, you don't know what the moment's going to be, but something you hope happens. And it's like, was it Joseph? Or it was like when Sonic Fox won or the read it boy thing with uh, God of War or, um, I think what went viral last year. It's like the Muppets thing, right? With the goose. It's like, you just yeah. love, love those moments and you hope they're good moments versus like terrible moments. But Joseph's thing, I was always like, I thought it was funny, right? I mean, it wasn't like, oh, yeah. F the game awards. It was sort of like <laughs> F, you know, the, the belief that the Oscars is like the most important award show in the world. Um, so yeah, Joseph's heart was in the right place and he, he definitely speaks his mind. Uh, game awards. It's, going to have to be virtual this year at this point, right? As we record here at the tail end of July. 
Yeah, we are. What I will say about it is we have a really interesting plan for the show this year. Um, we're definitely doing it, right? I think a lot of people are like, are you delaying it? You know, the Oscars are being postponed. You're postponing the Game Awards. It's like, we are absolutely not. Um, we'll share more in the coming weeks about it, but it's actually probably going to be our biggest show yet. We are obviously not going to have, you know, 10,000 people in a room together physically um, for the show. But I think you'll see a little bit of this with how we do Gamescom. Like, we're definitely doing more than just this, right? Of like me being in a room announcing winners. I'm really passionate about doing the show live still um, versus something pre-recorded. Um, so yeah, we're, we're, we're working on some scenarios for ways we can present the show live with a bit of spectacle to people without, you know, I mean, the public's not gonna be able to buy tickets to come to the show and things like that this year, right? So we're, but there's a lot of work and honestly our team is, working overtime thinking of like how we present this in a way that celebrates the industry in a bit bigger uh, fashion. So yeah, we're going to, we're going to do some live stuff. We're still hoping to do like some spectacle and scale to how we do things. Um, but yeah, we're, you know, likely not going to be able to do the traditional show this year. Um, but it's absolutely happening for sure. So I've got about eh, 20 or so minutes left with you. Uh, you mentioned we, yeah. so talk to me about, about, Jeff Incorporated for a second. Like, how how big is your team? What what's sort of your average day like, and and with the the crew that you're working with on a, on a regular yeah, basis? Yeah, uh, it depends. I mean, I I do a lot myself. Like, you know, this year obviously is different, right? Um, but yeah, normally, like a lot of my year is is talking with people, visiting developers. Like, often most of the summer, I'm traveling through kind of Europe and Asia, visiting studios, looking at their products for game awards. Um, that's the other thing is like, I'm very hands on with everything, right? There's not like a yeah. separate team that goes out and handles premieres, like pretty much everything I hand curate myself. Um, and I have a great team that handles production um, on the shows and the spectacle of, of the awards. So um, as like Kimmy H. Kim, who kind of co-produces the shows with me, um, in terms of the actual like teams and the, you know, the, the venues and the set and the stage and all that stuff um, around it. Um, and we have like, yeah, we have a good team that helps kind of produce the shows, but a lot of the editorial stuff is really like driven by me. Like I, you know, personally pitch every game studio on what we're doing with the show. I handle kind of, you know, all the booking of the talent um, in the show. I handle, you know, I mean, we have obviously a, a advisory board that kind of helps guide the show a little bit and and you and others at IGN help vote on the awards and select the nominees and winners which is part of the you know the worry last year was like oh Jeff's you know about to hook up Kojima with the award because he's his buddy and it's like you know that's all completely separate which I think people understand um but yeah it's like you know because I'm the face of the show it's it, it comes with some level of scrutiny because so much of of me is around it but yeah we have a really talented team um that works on our shows. And traditionally that's, you know, we have kind of three big beats a year. We usually do E3, Gamescom, and then the Game Awards. This year obviously has been a little bit different because I've been doing the Summer Game Fest stuff and then Game Awards and, and Gamescom. Um, but yeah, it's a really, it's a great group of like freelance folks that all kind of come together to build these shows and our team scales to hundreds of people in a normal year around Game Awards. Um, but yeah, traditionally like I'm, I'm traveling, I'm, uh, every day is different. Um, this year is a little, actually, I have more of a routine this year than I ever have, right? Because it's like, oh, let me get up. Let me go for a run. Let me, you know, do right. video calls. Normally, I'm racing to a plane. I'm like, oh, I'm flying to London. And then I got to go stop in North Carolina to visit Epic. And then I got to go to, you know, Seattle to go see Reggie or something. So um, this year is a little more normal. But yeah, I, I was never, my career has never been like sitting in an office, um, you know, with a team, uh, you know, having meetings all day. It's like, I'm very active out there, like meeting with developers, seeing people. I think that's part of the secret to my success, at least, is that I'm, you know, I love talking with people about games and seeing their stuff and, and visiting them. Well, you mentioned Hideo Kojima. Uh, you are not shy about your personal friendship with him. So uh, like what, where did this, where did that start? What is the origin of your, of your friendship with, with Hideo Kojima? Um, my, the origin of the friendship with Kojima, I think, st stems back to when I did the final hours of Metal Gear Solid 2 in 2001. Um, and yeah. I went over to Tokyo. Um, it was right after 9-11. Um, I remember flying on a 747 
and there was like no one on the plane. And I went over and visited him and wrote a story about the making of that game. And we just kind of hit it off. I think he's always, you know, he's been interested in kind of Western culture and Hollywood and LA and entertainment. And I think we just had like a common, you know, love of like movies and entertainment and talent. And we just sort of got to talking about things. Um, so I did that with him. And then, you know, for years we didn't really do a lot. And then as VGAs started to become a thing, he was one of the very early supporters of, of doing big game announcements at, at VGAs. Um, we did Metal Gear Rising Revengeance, I remember, which was like drama because I think that game leaked out of like Mexico the day of the show. And it was, anyways, it was a, the same year we announced The Last of Us. Um, we also did a Metal Gear Rising thing with him. So he's just always been like super supportive of my stuff. Um, I find him to just be, you know, a, a really intellectual person, but, but deeply human and emotional and how he thinks about things. Um, and you know, we don't, we don't really speak the same language. So it's like, it's fascinating that we have this sort of kinship with each other. Um, but yeah, I've always just been a, a fan of his games and how he thinks about pushing the medium forward, um, and respecting how, how, you know, how much he works to like, publicize his games and travel the world and meet with fans and understand other cultures. I think there are a lot of Japanese developers that just, you know, they don't think about how their games will do in the West or around the world. And he's always, he's just so curious. Like his eyebrows are always raised, like just learning about things. And I love that he hears about a new band and he gets excited about learning about them or, you know, new pieces of culture. Um, so yeah, I've always just like respected him, but again, like he's, people know about my friendship with him because he's so public on social media. But I mean, I have so many great friends in this business um, from designers to developers, to honestly, even like the, you know, the executives and the the publicists and stuff that I have known for decades. Um, so Kojima is one of my more public sort of friends, um, but it doesn't mean that I'm, you know, any less friends with Neil Druckmann at Naughty Dog or right. with, you know, the, the guys at id software, or, you know, elsewhere. It's like, I, you know, know lots of these people. Um, and that's why it's sometimes people think it's like, Oh, you know, he's going to throw the awards for Kojima, but it's like, I actually like, I loved a lot of the games last year and I I'm friends with lots of the developers. And that's honestly the, the hardest thing for me with the awards. And that's why I try, I keep myself out of it is because, yeah. you know, I, it's tough for me when you see people at the after party of the game awards and, you know, they lost game of the year and it's like, it's, you know, it's a great game. It just didn't get selected. And, you know, people in the gaming industry are naturally competitive because games are competitive. Um, so it's always a difficult thing, but yeah, Kojima has been, you know, an incredible friend and supporter. I was just talking to him a few weeks ago. We did a thing on summer game fest for the PC release of death stranding. Um, and yeah, I, I consider him to be, you know, a, a really unique voice in our industry with an interesting perspective on, games and design. So I will always, uh, you know, support him. Well, you, you and I, you, you, we both grew up playing games just since we were kids. So how much of a thrill was it to be in a video game, to be an NPC in Death Stranding? Well, it was good, but it was, uh, you know, controversial, I guess. It's funny because like I've been in games over the years, like Peter Molyneux in black and white, made me a villager that you could throw around in black and white. There was like a little Jeff <laughs> Keeley and you could toss it. It's like, you know, that didn't get any attention back in the day. Um, but yeah, it was, uh, look, I, I, I'm really careful about making sure that the legitimacy of, of the awards and what I do is, is, is never compromised. And doing the Death Stranding yeah. thing was obviously like, I was like excited about it, but I also knew that it would be you know, somewhat controversial that like he's in a game. And I'm, you know, I, I said, I've been in lots of games over the years, um, but that actually, I mean, the funny story on that is it didn't actually start as a, as a, uh, me being an NPC in the game. I, they scanned me years ago. Cause at one point Kojima had an idea for me to like appear in the death stranding world and kind of like host, like, you know, like from the game awards, like, Oh, I'm in death stranding and there's Jeff and he's basically like introducing the next world premiere, which is death stranding. And that right. never happened, but that was kind of the original idea. Um, and then I didn't know what happened with that? It just didn't happen. And then like all of a sudden he surprised me last year. It's like, Oh, by the way, like you're in this, uh, you know, you're in the game and here's your character and Matthew Mercer is your voice. And I'm like, cool. Um, so yeah, I like, it was surreal and kind of fun. Um, as you said, like people were asking me recently, like, are you in cyberpunk? Cause I think a bunch of folks are in that as well. And, um, yeah, it's, 
it's a thrill, but I'm also very mindful that like I have to be, you know, very careful about, you know, I would never like take a role in a game, right? Of like I'm speaking yeah. role and I'm like, you know, a character. So it was kind of a it was a fun nod to me, which I appreciate and was was good. But I really like, you know, I, I listened to everyone last year and heard all the feedback about people being concerned that, you know, uh, it was inappropriate. And I'm like, yeah, I, I, I totally understand that perspective. And I think about that. And I don't think I'm going to, you know, it's not a goal of mine to be a main character in a game at some point. Uh, I want to talk to you for our last few minutes here about this, just the industry at large, because I always have fun yeah. talking to you uh, about that stuff down at down at Judges Week. How do you feel? How are you feeling about the new console launches this year? What What do you feel like each Microsoft and Sony are doing well? Is you know is is Sony's iron grip on on that market share dominance permanent? Like what? Where are you kind of? How are you feeling about about the two new machines oh, this year? It's like my my Twitter feed will light up. Um, it's like yeah, people <laughs> are uh, look. I think so. What I will say overall is I'm I'm amazed that two new consoles are coming out this year in this environment um, with like yeah. the pandemic and, you know, like how they manufacture those in this world and still come out. And again, knock on wood, they do come out, but like I, that, that that's amazing to me, right? It's a true tribute, I think, to everyone working on these systems that that's able to happen this year. Um, in terms of the positioning of, of the machines, look, I think it's, they're going down different paths. And I think PlayStation is in a really strong position. I think, you know, PS5, great machine. Um, the controller, which I've got to play with, is really cool. An amazing lineup of first party games. I mean, they're kind of running the same play that they've run before. Um, yeah, and, you know, broke. worked really well for them. And I think, you know, the games they showed in their lineup, I mean, I'm really excited. I mean, the SSD stuff looks incredible. Um, so I'm excited about that. Xbox, you know, is playing a different game and is, you know, I think the Game Pass stuff is a really compelling story um, for them. I just, and I think, you know, that's, it's differentiated, right? Um, and we'll see what they do with pricing and whatnot. Um, but I think Xbox is, you know, has a, has a good story as well and a different story than what Sony is, is approaching. So we'll see. I mean, I, I think Xbox has to, you know, really deliver the great first party games, right? I mean, that's always sort of the challenge for them. And, you know, I think Halo had its challenges, you know, last week when they showed it. And I, I, I hope that's going to really like, you know, shape up to be an awesome launch game for them. Um, you know, who knows what Sony has for launch, right? They've been kind of like vague about it. They've got a lot of games coming, but like what's actually coming at launch around it. And, and overall, it's a, it's a different year because, you know, things, a different generation, because, you know, I think one of the biggest launch games is going to be Cyberpunk for all these systems, which is, you know, really? just going to run better on these systems, but it's like forwards and backwards compatibility. Um, so it's different. It's not like, you know, oh, I got, like, you remember, it's like, used to be like, oh, I got to keep around my Xbox because that game's coming out that I want to play on it. And I still yeah. got the new one. And it's like, when can I disconnect, you know, PS2? Because I, I, you know, I want to hook up my PS3, but there's that game coming out that's only on PS2. So I think there's going to be a lot of, blended stuff all together. But I would say like, I think Sony has a really strong story to tell. We don't know what the price is there, but I mean, I'm really excited about some of the games that I've seen there and, you know, Sony's mastery of these incredibly rich single player experiences. I think Xbox has a really good story about value for gamers um, around a lot of diversity of choices. I think their challenge is, I think Sony's challenge will be sort of like, the price and the premium experience and making sure that people are able to sort of, you know, purchase into that this year. Xbox's challenge, I think, is that Game Pass is great, but it's got to have the really great flagship games in it, right? And you don't want it to sort of be like your basic cable package where it's like, hey, it's a lot of cool mm -hmm. stuff, but like what I really want is HBO. And it's like, you know, those games are outside of Game Pass. Um, and I don't know, I tend to think people, you know, they care more about the really big games that are going to move the needle and not just like I I want to you know an okay game to kind of play this weekend there's a little bit of that and again I'm not a great test for that because I get access to so many games already right you and I like we get all these things shipped to us for free or we get codes so you know the average gamer there's there's value there to that um so it's kind of long-winded answer but I would say I'm excited about the new consoles I think both platforms have really unique, interesting stories to tell. Um, but no, I don't, I, I don't see anything right now 
from Xbox that makes me feel like, you know, it's going to dramatically alter sort of the, the course of things. Um, but, you know, we have to see what the prices are on these things. Like, that's going to be like a big question of like, you know, is there a big difference between the prices of the two systems? Um, and the other thing is like, you know, the Xbox stuff, I still think they have to prove kind of the world's most powerful console thing. Like they keep talking about that. And, you know, I'm not, I don't need to cite all the specs and stuff, but I still think they really need to kind of show that. Um, if it is, you know, if, if Series X really is most powerful, it's like, I, I want to see the games that really demonstrate that. Um, and I haven't seen that yet. And I'm not sure power really is the be on end all. It's like, it comes down to the games and the content. And I think no matter what system you buy, you're going to end up, you know, having a lot of, having a lot of fun, um, with them. So yeah, I'm excited. I think like they're both going to be really good machines, and I think Game Pass and X Cloud is going to move the industry in a really interesting direction too. Yeah, well, we're recording for posterity's sake. It's July 31st, so maybe by the time this airs, prices oh, that's true. Have been yeah. announced. I guess we'll, I was going to we'll say, find yeah, out, did, but, just, but I just leaked case, the price uh, like I did that one year at E3. It's so funny. Like I still get that in my Twitter feed. <laughs> of people are like, "Are you going to leak the price because you did uh, E3?" And it's like, yeah, I, I will say like horror. the. No, it's it's it's. We'll see. I I feel like. I don't know. And, you know, there's rumors that Xbox has this Lockhart, which is like a cheaper Xbox. And then, you know, Sony's got the the regular one and the all digital. So, look, people love to debate this stuff. And I, I honestly, I sometimes don't even talk about this stuff on Twitter because it's just like it's become so controversial about like, you know, it's, which yeah, system are you like people were counting how many tweets I was putting up about like Xbox versus PlayStation. I'm like, guys, it's like I'm just going to talk about, you know, what's out there and what I'm excited about. And it's okay if I'm like excited about one system and, and a game on a different system. Um, and yeah, that whole sort of console wars mentality. I just don't think about things that way. It's like, look, we, people always say like, oh, he's a PlayStation fanboy," And it's like, well, but like we announced the new Xbox at Game Awards last year. Like that was a massive <laughs> moment. It's like you forget about that. And it's, uh, look, I, I traditionally have really loved a lot of the exclusive PlayStation games. And those have been like super meaningful to me from my sort of adventure game roots. Like I really love rich story driven um, tales, yeah. but I've also like, I've loved stuff on Xbox as well. And I sure hope that Halo is amazing and, you know, Fable, I'm super excited about that. And like Xbox has some great stuff in the pipeline from an exclusive first party perspective. I just think it's going to be a few years till we get all of it. Right. Uh, before I let you go, should E3 come back in its traditional form, assuming we can all congregate in the future. I mean, you do uh, you do the uh, the YouTube Coliseum down there for them, but just yeah. separating the, the that sort of business interest as all it were, the controversial just as, as questions. Industry thing. Um, <laughs> yeah, look, as an industry I, thing, do you want E3 come back? Yeah, like I I love E3. I've been to every E3, and it really broke my heart when. Uh, I decided not to do it this year before, you know, it got canceled. Um, yeah. My whole thing with E3 is that it, it really needs to evolve um, as a concept. And you will find no bigger fan of what E3 represents than me. And part of the reason I kind of broke up with what E3 was going to be this year is I did not believe that it was going to represent the industry in the right way and in the sort of progressive way that it needed to be. And that was hard for me, but I kind of had to take a stand for that. Um, you know, and we did the summer game fest thing, um, kind of as, you know, a response to just like not having an E3. I wasn't, you know, people were like, did you leave E3 to launch summer game fest? And like, no, I left E3 thinking that E3 was going on and I just wasn't going to be a part of it. And then as the sort of cards fell, I ended up doing the summer game fest thing. So we had something. And, and people rightfully have said like, hey, Summer Game Fest is too spread out. It's four months. Why isn't it all in two weeks? And I'm like, I hear you and I agree with you. It's just like given the way things were breaking down with COVID and everything, like we had to cast a wide net this year to capture all right. the events. Is it ideal? No, but it's better than the other option, which was nil of like nothing. So it was in like you guys, IGN, Summer Gaming, like you guys did something Same too. Thing, it's like yeah. we, we kind of fill that void. So, you know, will there be a summer game fest next year? Maybe. Will it be the same length? I hope if, you know, we do it, it's like we can condense it all down into a month or something. Right. But that requires all the game companies and everyone to kind of align around that and like make that work. And one of the things this year was like, I knew pretty early on that Microsoft was going to be in July, not in June. And Sony was going to be there. And it's like, sorry guys, like, you know, you have two platforms six weeks apart. 
we got to, you know, kind of cast a wider net. Um, yeah. So, you know, E3 really matters to me. I'm hopeful that E3 finds a way to evolve. And I put, you know, a, you know, I haven't really talked a lot about this, but I put a lot of ideas in front of the ESA on how I wanted to see E3 evolve. And a lot of them are, you know, very digital focused and global focused. And it just didn't seem like they were ready to kind of take that leap. And and I, I understand because they're, you know, it's a legacy business of like a trade show that has to evolve into something new. It's, it's not unlike when I was at Viacom, you know, I was doing a television award show and what ended up being the best thing for me and everyone, I think, was just sort of like making a break from that versus trying to transition right. that into a digital show. That's when we got VGX, right? Remember that? Me and Joel McHale. And like it was kind of better to just break and do something brand new. So that's kind of what happened this year. I was like, I just think we need to try some of these ideas in a brand new way this year, see how they work. I'm really happy with um, how the Summer Game Fest stuff has gone overall. I agree it's been too spread out. But yeah, I mean, E3's announced dates for next year. I don't know if people are going to be able to gather physically for much next year even, right? I mean, you hear about we'll Google see. with all their employees being out through next summer. Like, I don't know. We'll see. So I'm I'm the first person who would be love to see a really strong digital E3. That brand means a lot to the industry, and I'm totally open to, you know, working on that. Um, it just, I think, has to be under the right circumstances with the right vision and approach um, for it. So I'd love to see E3 you know, come back in a strong way. And if not, totally happy to keep building the Summer Game Fest thing as well um, or something new. So I'm, you know, I'm flexible in that regard. But yeah, I miss E3, right? Like it's, I miss seeing you and everyone in the industry and having that runoff. Like I'm, people always say to me, like, why is Summer Game Fest so spread out? Like, I love singular events. Like we do that with Gamescom Opening Night Live. We do that with the Game Awards, right? That's all in two hours. We like pack everything together. So I love that concept of everything being this runoff and this kind of jam packed week. Uh, and even personally for me, this summer stuff's been tough because like we're constantly doing stuff and I kind of love, we do E3 and then I get to go on vacation and go work on game awards. Um, so yeah, like it's obviously, you know, a very important event to me every year. And I hope that it, it comes back in some form. It would be sad if E3 just sort of like disappears. Like that's, that's not what I want. I'm with you. Yeah. And what I think a lot of people may not understand is you didn't start on Summer Game uh, Fest and we didn't start on Summer of Gaming until literally the day E3 was officially canceled. And then we had to scramble. Yeah. We're both scrambling to put these things together in weeks in what would normally be planned out for months. So, oh, yeah, no, that's the thing. Like, I stuff. had no plans. And, like, honestly, there was a plan for like this digital E3 thing that didn't come together. And I was like, you know, I had seen those plans. I'm like, I don't think this is going to work either. And yeah, I said it was at a necessity that game companies started calling me saying like, hey, can you pull us together into something? So as you said, the option was kind of nothing or this type of stuff. And I'm really happy that the industry rallied behind this. Um, you know, I didn't, the Summer Game Fest thing, I didn't, it wasn't really a job. It wasn't for the money. It was just like, I think we need to come up with something as a container. And we've learned a lot um, about how to do these digital events. And I agree with consumers that are like, it's so spread out. It's, you know, drip, drip, drip. I want everything in one week. And like, I agree, but these games are all being made work from home. Schedules are being delayed. People don't know if their games are going to come out. Like we're honestly lucky that we get what we get this year. Um, given the circumstances that the world is in, I think sometimes people forget that, um, that they expect everything to be like, just like normal. And it's like, guys, like you're probably affected in your own life in some way. And these game developers are too. So, you know, 21 hopefully will be different, but some of the lessons learned from this summer, I hope will apply to, you know, however E3 or whatever happens next year gets executed. Well, in the meantime, we can look forward to Mr. Jeff Keeley on Gamescom opening night live coming up, uh, I guess, as this airs very, very soon. <laughs> and then yes, uh, August we'll 27th, to... Thursday is when Thank opening you. night live is. And I know IGN's got coverage uh, for the next few days. So yes. we're going to do a, a digital Gamescom this year. Yes, indeed. Looking forward to that. And then the Game Awards in some fashion. You heard Jeff talk about it uh, later on in the year. And then we'll see what, what comes around from for E3 next year. And then, of course, the final hours of Half-Life Alex available now on All my Steam. Plugs. It I is love a it. fantastic, yes, fantastic look back at the, a chronicle of the entire, uh, not just Alex process, but the last like 10 plus years of Valve. It's really fascinating. 
uh, if you're if you're interested in sort of the what goes into this this incredible uh, myth, this, this mythological status that Valve has attained. Jeff Keeley, it's always good to see you, my friend. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, honored to be on here. Thanks for inviting me on. And uh, yeah, we will hopefully see you in person sometime soon. I look forward to it. For more from the best, brightest, most interesting minds in the games industry, be sure to check with me every month for a new episode of IGN Unfiltered.